Okay. Five. Should have. Uh, I have. I had set it up like a while ago. Oh, hey, stream elements just popped up to let me know that I'm live, so that's back. Um, I had set it up. So obviously, I've had like the stream elements bot in my chat for a while. But I finally have it set up where it will actually show the notifications and everything. I finally found the button that links stream elements to my um to my OBS setup. So now if any lurkers wanna, you know, subscribe or even just follow, there's this little box in the upper left hand corner where the um tabs and the um navigation tools on my firefox are right now that will turn into fun magic images to announce that you have done so so at least i've got that going for me because god knows i can't do anything related to my tablet and streaming yeah, I have no idea why. Like, I managed to get stupid blue stacks to work once, where it would have let me play Opera Omnia on it on stream, and then I could not duplicate it later. So, I figured it out, and... But, or, I thought I'd figured it out, and then as it turns out, no... No, I did not, because if I had successfully figured it out, we wouldn't be having this issue. The actual um, fifth anniversary has been pretty fun. I enjoyed the 50 poll, even though I did not get anything good out of it. I got a dupe burst and a dupe FR and no unique... Um, any of the lower class weapons that I didn't already have, so that was a bit... It was fun to do, but yeah, there's no way they would ever get the money out of me to do it again for how ineffectual it was at the end of the day. Um, but it was fun to push the button and watch all these orbs like show off all their weapons and whatnot and see what I got. Um, the actual free pulls for Pinello's Banner went way better, although I did get psyched out by the fact that there are, um, other FRs and burst weapons on those banners besides hers, so the first free pull I got a dupe BT instead, and the other one, so I got Arden's off of the first one, then from the second banner with her stuff on it, I did get her FR on the free pull, but then I got a dupe, um... What's his name? Laguna. For the other one, so. It was fun, and I got her FR, so I'm waiting for the other events related to her to try and free roll the burst before I token it, but. All things considered, I had a good time, and I like all the. F I love all the free stuff. I think they're doing a great job with that. Like, the free daily pulls are really fun now, and. I'm enjoying all of this, and I don't mind, like, a lot of people did not like the things like Dare to Defy when they came out. I like them because this is stuff that the JP version of the game did not get, so even if you don't, even if you can't complete them, even if they're too hard... Whatever you can do with the resources that you have is just free resources that you get for com for clearing the events. Like the last Dare to Defy, I did not full complete that. I could have, but I would have had to spend more resources maxing out characters than I would have gotten back from doing it in the first place. And I did not have plans to use those characters outside of the Dare to Defy event, so... The idea of using those resources to bolster those characters and then, like, leave them in the box later on and just focus on the other characters. I didn't want to do that, so I didn't. So I just didn't get the other 
prizes that I would have had to spend like three times that amount of prizes just to get one more of any of them. It's just like, no, no, I'm good. Thanks. Anyway, so I know I talked a lot about wanting to stream Opera Omni and that I thought I was going to be able to do it. I was genuinely excited for it. And then it didn't work. And then it still didn't work. And after trying like four or five times, I realized that no, I, I had just gotten, I, I feel so tricked by stream elements that I thought I had managed to find a workaround to its hatred of Windows 11. And then I still couldn't get it to work when I actually needed it to. And it's just been so frustrating. But anyway, we're working on Urza, and we only need 37 more cuts. So, if we have less than 100, like, like if we had 100 cards, I'd need to cut 40% of the deck. So, I need to cut a little bit less than that. And 40% is two out of every five cards. So, yeah. So... If we're going to keep, like, one, two, three, four, five, if we're going to keep everything from the Alpha Beta Unlimited list, that, then that means we got to cut two cards from somewhere else, and so on in that manner. And, yeah, these last, like, was so I just said, uh, it's 37. These last 37 cuts are going to be almost entirely all ugly things that I don't want to cut and that I'm super sad about cutting. Because every single thing left on this list is actually doing the thing and would work in the deck. Like, maybe I cut Palancron. Like, yes, it does work with Urza. It goes infinite immediately if we can turn it into an artifact. Like, we cast it, we untap the seven lands, we tap... Um, well, we have to be able to cast it with seven lands in play. We need, like, we can't just ramp into it with artifact mana. That doesn't work, but... Assuming that we cast it with seven lands in play, and we tap to turn it into an artifact with one of the liquid metal cards, we immediately get to go infinite at that point, <clears throat> making as many palancrons that are 3-3 three, three flyers instead of 4-5 flyers that we want. <clears throat> Unless there's a dies in response, but, you know. The, the important thing is, is that we set it up and we actually do get to go infinite. <clears throat> One of the big things we can do is we can cut the cards that <clears throat> tax the opponent's mana in the meantime. <clears throat> I do find it funny that for all the power level I put into these decks, I wind up cutting a lot of the cards that <clears throat> people just jam into decks because they're generically powerful. And we have a whole bunch of cards on that list that aren't doing anything specific that we need to like i put in a lot of mana rocks and tutors and those are also just generically powerful cards but they have a purpose in the deck ristic study is in here because it taxes the opponent and sometimes we get to draw cards i find cards like ristic study more annoying to have to play around than good i think that cards like ristic study do way better against opponents that are either being taxed on their resources from like multiple angles where they can't afford to pay and they can't afford to not do stuff <clears throat> than they do when they're just like oh by the way do you pay one do you pay one do you pay one do you pay one every time anybody else casts a spell like i because i don't find that particularly good i find it mildly annoying for what it does like if your opponents are playing properly then <clears throat> ristic study is like a known force spike more so than anything else <laughs> like do, do you have enough mana left over when, when you cast it that you can pay for a force spike because you need to <clears throat> and yeah sometimes that really does slow the other players down enough that you get to like, you don't get to draw the cards, but you do buy yourself more time. But it takes a lot more for that card to buy you time than an actual, like, you must pay the one or you don't get your spells effect type of thing, so. 
So yeah, I don't... I don't super care for cards like Rhystic Study. I do not actually have Rhystic Study in any of my commander decks, nor do I have um, uh, Smothering Tithe. So... So yeah, I don't, I don't feel the need to have this in there. I just, this is one of the few times where I've built a deck where it can be good. Like, good in, like, good in the sense that the way I like the cards to function in the decks when I put them in there, like, I have a plan for it and it's going to, um, it's going to actually do the thing that I put it in the deck for. Whereas, I feel like if I just throw Rhystic Study into most of my decks, I'm just hoping that my opponents either don't pay the one and just let me draw all of these cards, or that them paying the one slows them down enough that it buys me enough time to find answers to the things that they're doing. And that's just kind of underwhelming. Uh, the same is true for Smothering Tithe. Like, I, I look at Smothering Tithe and I compare it to, um, like, Thran Dynamo, right? If you spend four mana on Smothering Tithe and you don't untap with the ability to add three extra mana to your mana pool on the next turn then you're getting less out of Smothering Tithe, or, yeah, you're getting less out of Smothering Tithe than you would if you just cast Thrand Dynamo. So, unless you, you're getting that um, hidden value where the opponent didn't get to do a thing because they paid for Smothering Tithe, then you're not getting more out of Smothering Tithe than you would out of, like, a four-drop Mana Rock. And... But when you do get more out of it, like... And in certain decks, you can force your opponents to draw cards and then not have them be able to pay and not be able to use the cards. And you get to draw cards also, and then you have extra mana to work with. That's great. Like, decks where you're playing, like, Time Spiral and Time Twister and Wheel of Fortune and all of those type of cards, and you can just get all of this mana for having Smothering Tithe in play, then yes, in those type of decks, Smothering Tithe is doing way more than Thran Dynamo would, and you should probably be running Smothering Tithe instead. But I feel like people just jam it in there because they're like, oh, this is going to make the opponents miserable playing Magic with me. So, like, eventually we want to get to the point where we're overtaxing our opponents and they don't get to do anything, which is kind of why I want to leave these cards in there. Like, Rhystic Study, the one exception is Wandering Archaic out of all of the opponent pays more because, <clears throat> as I've said many times, you can get into situations where <clears throat> you and the other player just agree that being able to, like, not paying is good for both you and the other player you get to take a resource an additional resource away from one of your mutual opponents type of thing so if you and that player can agree on what needs to blow up then it's actually a much better um hard to have than other things that might let you copy your opponent's stuff because then you're getting it way cheaper and you're getting a decent sized body on it too it's like a five mana four four or something so you can actually like attack players and deal damage or punch through a planeswalker or something in some cases like the opponent just doesn't have their own giant thing to get in its way at the time Yeah, we are down to that point. Every single card left in this deck is something I want to run. It's either one of the combo pieces, a way to get a combo piece, or a way to not lose the game while trying to find combo pieces. So... That we are out of room. 
which of these which of these are the worst ways to do all of the things I want to do Yeah, it's true. Esper Sentinel also falls into that same category. So we would also we'd be able to cut out four cards. Which would still leave me with what, like thirty that I need to get rid of? We get rid of the Night Paladin. Night Paladin is one of those cards where we can just win if um whatchamacallit, if we just start Urzaing, like we get if we can make copies of this dealing four damage to each opponent. I mean, from full you need ten of them, but that's not impossible for a like we can go infinite sometimes with what we have, so just being able to keep making Night Paladins over and over again. Like, we only need to get Urza down to 2 to activate at that point. Uh, then we make a copy of Night Paladin. Then we sack the copy to our Ironworks, and we just win. Also, I think, yeah, we should be able to win with Ashnod's Altar. So what we would do is we would crew <coughs> the first Night Paladin with Urza. And then make the copy of it. Then tap the, or actually, we make the copy of it and we crew the copy. Right? And we tap the copy to crew the original. And we sock that to Urza, put the new one into play, tap the... We'd still have to lose the original, I think, is the only issue. At some point in time, we're going to have to lose the original in order to... But we can keep crewing... With the untapped one. Like... Right? Maybe. Hang on. So we tap Urza, we crew the first one, we make the copy. We tap the co we tap the um crewed one to crew the other one and then sacrifice the tapped one that we just used to crew and make a copy. And then we tap the one that's at yeah, so yeah, we can keep cycling through. That's the only thing is that we're going to lose the original at some point in time in order for this to work. He, whichever way we crew it, we wind up having to sac. We'll, we'll wind up having to tap and sacrifice one of them in order to keep the chain going. But that would work. So if that's working, that then we. I mean, we might still wind up having to get rid of the Night Paladin just because. Even though it can go infinite, a lot of the things in this deck can go infinite, so... With Urza and Ironworks or Ashnod's Altar. Yeah, I know. I keep building decks that want to sacrifice things, and... I keep winding up using Ashnod's Altar because that is probably one of the best cards in all of Magic to sacrifice things to. If you are trying to set up a loop... Like, there's very few things in Magic that work better than no cost, no tapping it, lose one of your things in play, and get two of a resource. Like, everything else that can do anything near that is either a one-shot deal, or uh, once per turn, or has an additional cost associated with it that you have to also be able to pay, so... 
Ashnod's Altar just does a wonderful job of going infinite with so many cards that have generic mana activations. And Urza being exactly six to activate means that there are just going to be a handful of cards where it goes infinite just because it doesn't require any colored mana, it doesn't tap Urza, and the altar doesn't tap. And because he's so artifact focused, we get to uh, put Croc Clan Ironworks in too. So artifact creature focus, basically. Like, we get to run both of them because they're both going to be relevant. Is there any other mana rock we can get rid of? The problem is I think every single one of them now is either super cheap or is doing a thing in the deck anyway. Like, I really like the idea of uh, Skyclave Relic or Dark Stealing it if we're planning to do the Intruder Alarm thing because then the opponent has to actually you know, minus X, minus X, or exile, or put them all to the top or bottom of the deck. You know, bounce everything. They they have to do something other than the generic wrath the board. Otherwise, they're not going to kill all of them. And then we just recast Urza and we still win. So. But we're so tight on room for all of this. That that might be the biggest thing, is that I have a couple of different ways to go infinite with the deck, so maybe we just have to cut out a subset of them in order to make this work. Like, yes, we can go infinite with Intruder Alarm and making token copies of the Mana Dorks. But do we just want to cut Intruder Alarm then and not focus on that and focus on the other ways that we can go infinite instead? Because with Intruder, Intruder Alarm is only going infinite if we have combined mana dorks enough to make um, six mana or however much Urza needs to activate if we can get his cost down. Which should be relatively easy if we can get any of the cost reduction effects. But at the same time... Because it's just another way to make infinite man. Instead of having uh, Urza's casting cost all the way down and having Ironworks or Altar in play, we just have his casting cost down enough relative to the number of um, token copies of any of our mana rocks. So that way they'll keep getting untapped every time something new comes into play. The downside to um, to the intruder alarm, though, is that if we're not raising the casting cost of all of their spells at the time, opponents might be able to go infinite by looping a creature into play and out of play and untapping all of their other creatures, like... They kind of need to already have a deck that does that, and we just played the Intruder Alarm for them in that scenario, but that is possible. It's a little easier to go infinite, though, than it is with Ironworks or Ashnod's Altar because Urza's base activation is so high. But even if we have it, we still, we either need to play Intruder Alarm early, so that way putting the other Mana Dorks into play untaps the rest of them, so that way we get a rebate on the mana that we're using to activate Urza until we have enough of them in play that we can actually do it. Because I already cut the Unwinding Clock, which is another thing that would help us build out the board fast enough, you know, if we could make a dude on each player's turn, because we are we have enough of them, plus what mana we have. You know, if we, have, if we can get four mana out of our creatures and Urza is still stuck at six, that's fine. If we can then make the other 
two during the same turn cycle and get back to us, as long as nobody else manages to go infinite with intruder alarm is the issue, so... But I'm thinking maybe we just do cut intruder alarm. It works with what we have, but at the end of the day it is a... Uh, secondary combo that we can do, so if we just focus on the main combo instead. Doctor Squadron is close, but we need so much mana the first time. Like, if we spend six to copy it, Right. Or hang on. We need we can't be spending six to copy, right? Six doesn't work. It's if Urza's at four. This works. So it enters with three counters and we can spend one to remove a counter to make a Thopter. So we can net three mana from that, and the Thopter itself is four or five. So yeah, if Urza is down to four, Thopter Squadron is infinite. Um Workhorse is infinite mana. Alencron is infinite without that. Yeah, I think I want to remove either the Junk Diver or the um, Mirror. I'm inclined to remove the Junk Diver because it's one more mana, but... The Mirror Retriever, you know, the Junk Diver can fly, and that can be relevant if we just need to deal a damage to a player for, like, specific purposes. Uh, stealing the Monarchy or the Initiative, um, keeping their Planeswalker in check because they have a decent, like, ground stall going. Um, just to trigger anything that cares about the, like stopping them from not taking damage on the turn and getting Luminarch Ascension online. Any of those sort of things. Junk Diver helps a lot more with that than, you know, random 1-1 one -one on the ground is going to. I think the main reason to cut Palancron is it's not naturally an artifact, and that gives us more... Artifact density for the metal worker. Like, we still have other stuff we want to turn into artifacts and copy, but the Palancron not naturally being an artifact. A lot of things not naturally being an artifact in this deck are kind of meh for that reason. All right, so I stopped on Trinket Mage. So Trinket Mage gets a lot of our very, very good artifacts, but does it actually get any combo pieces? And I'm wondering, is that, like, since it doesn't get any combo pieces specifically, like, yes, we can get our Soul Ring and our Top, you know, Mana Vault, uh, Codex Shredder to get back, and something that got milled or destroyed earlier in the game. Like, there's a lot of stuff we can get with Trinket Mage, but none of it is the essential pieces of the deck. Like, with the um, Tribute Mage, we can actually go get... Um, Sphere of Resistance, which is or Thorn of Amethyst, which we want to copy to make everything too expensive for the opponents. It can also go get us um, Grim Monolith if we have the power artifact in order to generate the infinite mana from Grim Monolith that way. It can go get um, there's something else too, I feel like. In addition to just being able to go get mana rocks, oh, excuse me, mana rocks and whatnot. So yeah, Trinket Mage isn't actually getting combo pieces. And... Technically, the 
uh, Treasure Mage is getting combo pieces, but it can only get the ones where we're already at that point where we just need, like, the Mere Battle Sphere. It can also get, like, the Spine of Isha or something to destroy some, like, a problematic permanent that's either stopping us from going off or just killing us in general, and we need to buy time. <sighs> Maybe that's it. So, by the time we can cast, um, Spine of Isha and Meteor Golem, like, we need ways to get rid of stuff, so I'm disinclined to cut, like, to just cut both of them, but I'm wondering if we need both of them. <sighs> like, maybe we still do, maybe we just cut the Treasure Mage. So Treasure Mage, what's the most important thing that Treasure Mage is getting for us? Is it Mere Battle Sphere? It gets our six plus drops. So, if its primary thing is tutoring for answers in the late game, or, like, one specific game... So, it can get Workhorse. That's one of the infinite combos it can enable. Um, yeah, let's focus on, like... Yes, it can get another removal spell, but what finishers can it go get? Because Darksteel Forge also doesn't just win the game on the spot. Arkham. I'm really curious right now what game ending card. So we got two of the Battle Sphere. Uh... Session. Dance of the Mance. So far, it's just getting those two cards. Is there anything else? Tutor the Guard, Spell Seeker, Force of Negation. <clears throat> Idol. Okay, so I think. Yeah, I can't even get the Knight Paladin. Alright, I think we cut. Uh, treasure mage then and we might actually seriously cut the trinket mage also and just leave the tribute mage I guess we double check on tribute mage too we should double check both of them just to make absolutely sure that we need any of them because if we can cut all three of them I think we can cut um, recruiter of the guard possibly there's still a handful of other things that Recruiter uh, tutors for, but maybe. Alright, so again, actual combo pieces versus just, like, useful. Like, I consider Man of Alt and Soul Ring to be very useful things to tutor for, especially in the early game, but they don't actually win us the game. So what things can we tutor for with the other two that actually win us the game? Um, Tribute Mage has Sphere of Resistance. That is one of the things that we want to just make enough copies of that it stops the opponents from being able to participate in the game, and then we just get to win. Um, uh, those are other things we can get, but nothing. Nine, three, four, four. Top is one, but again, that's more useful than game ending. Uh, Thorn of Amethyst is our backup to Sphere of Resistance. It does still allow for creatures that ruin our day, so anything from, uh, Loran and, um... Uh, what's the green one? The stupid elf that blows up artifacts and enchantments from M sets. Four sets. I'm Reclamation Sage. Like, name just completely went out of my head. So everything from, like, that kind of generic, oh, this can stop our combo by being able to blow up a key piece all the way up through Bane of Progress. 
So there's still plenty of creatures, but it's way better than nothing. And if something has happened to our sphere of resistance and we can't get it back yet, like we haven't found Karn or we have to like, it can't be something where we retutor for it because we would just go grab it over the thorn. Like it's the ideal one. The thorn is the backup, but we do need backups. So for things that are that important to the deck. Uh, again, Expedition Map is just helping us assemble Tron or get um, Mishra's Workshop or something, so very useful. Uh, liquid Metal Coating, again, if we need to turn the thing into an artifact to enable our combo, we need that or the Torque, so Codex Shredder gets things back. Illusionist Bracers is okay, but more making things easier on us than comboing out immediately. It does help the things like Illusionist Bracers help a lot with uh, getting infinite mana if we don't reduce Urza's cost because then copying something is now two copies. Uh, the same with Anointed Procession giving us two artifacts instead of one. Like that helps an awful lot with things like the Thopter where if we pay one and we get two creatures, and we can sack both of them and get four mana, we're now netting three mana per activation instead of two mana, or instead of one mana per activation, so. That puts a lot, that takes a lot of the stress off of our artifacts. Okay, so, Walking Ballista is a thing we can tutor for with um, Trinket Mage, since it is a zero. And that thing can be a combo, like, can be used with our infinite combo, so that might be one of the few other one mana or less things that we can tutor for. I'm still not seeing enough, though, for the one mana slot. Like, I do see enough for the two mana slot. Interestingly enough, we can also tutor up our graveyard hate if we need it. Still not winning us the game, but that does... Uh, meet more requirements for me to want to run it in the deck. Yeah, Tribute Mage seems like the best one for this deck. We have card draw we can tutor for, but we have more combo pieces at the two than we do at any other mana cost, so yeah, I think we get rid of Trinket Mage. Alright, so how many things does Recruiter get? It already gets Voltaic Construct. I think Recruiter is going to stay, but let's just double check. Okay, Recruiter can get all three of these. Mindless Automaton, Thopter Squadron, and Workhorse. <clears throat> so... That's already ridiculously good. It can get Junk Diver, Metal Worker. Yeah, it's going to be able to get way too much stuff, isn't it? Uh, it gets too toughness, so it can't get that. It can get the Mirror Retriever, the, sa the Sad Robot, Voltaic Construct, which is a combo enabler. Ooh, excuse me. Gets Arkham, which is one of our other tutors, and then can tutor for things that the Recruiter can't tutor for. Gargoyle's got too much defense, so is Lodestone. Uh, can tutor metam Metamorph. Um, metamorph. Metamorph. Uh, can't get Padim. Can get Scrap Trawler. Can get Walking Ballista. Okay, it can get the Lion Sash, can't get Tameshi. Um, Deer Golem's too much, Muzio's one toughness too high. It can get Spellseeker, though, to go get our tutors for our other things. The Tribute Mage, right now Esper Sentinel's still in the deck. Yeah, okay. Like, we could cut, 
like three or four more cards that it can tutor for, and it would probably still make the deck just on the value of the remaining cards it can go grab. Alright, so we cut Trinket Mage, Treasure Mage, and Intruder Alarm. That almost brings us below 90. Oh wait, no it doesn't. I have 97. Why did I think I had like 94 left? Alright, well now I have 94 left, so... Uh, 34 more cuts to go. Uh, I think I'm going to cut the cards that tax the opponents early and don't, like, straight up do what I want them to do. Ristic Study. So there's four of them all together. It's Ristic Study. It's, um, oh god, I get Smothering Tithe. I can picture Smothering Tithe in my head and... Uh, Esper Sentinel and Wandering Archaic. Okay. All right, so we cut those four, scroll back up, down to 90. We need 30 more cuts. So, one in every three cards has to go. <sighs> Save. You're all. <sighs> Do I cut Mana Vault? That feels like it can't be correct. It is one of the least effective of our mana rocks. It ramps us really hard once, and then it kind of, like we've cut the Voltaic key and the manifold key, which leaves us with Tezzeret as a cheap way to untap it. So its primary value is in the first few turns of the game to let us cast our more expensive mana rocks early on and then maybe take a turn off untapping it, so that way when we untap the next time, we have a ton of mana to work with. And there's always the chance, like, during certain turns, that we pay the four mana and untap it, and we wind up tapping it to cast a spell, so we essentially spent an extra mana for nothing. But it's not, like, that's the... Worst case, well, the worst case scenario is we spend extra mana for nothing, and then we could have used that extra mana for something else in that same turn. This is the actual worst case scenario, but that doesn't come up super often, I feel like. <sighs> With only the... Um... The map and Talaria West. I'm wondering if the Urzatron isn't too hard to assemble and we should just cut like my we should cut Mine Tower Power Plant and um Urza's Workshop and just run Urza's Saga. More so because it will tutor for our um like our soul ring or our mana vault or our mana crypt when it dies or our top, you know, any of those. And that would free up the spot that treasure map or tre not treasure map expedition map is taking. Also, I've had capsize on the list because we generate so much colorless mana potentially, but once we're generating that much, we're usually going to be using it for other things, and we won't have the double blue. So, yes, we are making tons of mana, but we still can't, we're still restricted on what we can do with capsize due to blue mana restrictions, and that would require us to run Phyrexian Altar also, 
once we have infinite mana, because if we have infinite mana, we can eventually filter it to blue, even if we're losing mana on the filtering process. You know, subtracting 20 from infinite mana to, to make, you know, like 10 blue mana still leaves us with infinite mana, so... But yeah, I think we can cut capsize them. We do still have um, Cyclonic Rift to bounce problematic permanence. And once we have infinite mana, we're going to be able to like Spine of Isha or Meteor Golem if we need to. So yeah, the capsize is a bit unnecessary. We already have counter spells and like assorted removal. So let's just go ahead and cut that one. Reckoning. I probably still want Arkham, and I probably still want Muzio. I'm really seriously debating if we need uh, Dark Steel Forge, though. Like, originally it's in here because, you know, we're an artifact-heavy deck with a lot of tutors and some ways to bypass casting costs. Do we not just want to slam a Darksteel Forge and make it that much harder for our opponents to interact with us? And the answer is, yeah, we kind of do, but at the same time... Like, I feel like a lot of the time, if we're not worried about an actual wrath, uh, Padim would do much the same thing, stopping our opponents from being able to interact with our things. Yeah, Darksteel Forge saves us from Wrath of God variants and um, large scale pyroclasms like uh, Blasphemous Act. But it doesn't protect from target removal and from exile or bounce. And Padim does not protect from wrath effects and um, damage effects on our, like, mass damage effects on our creatures, so. Yeah, I feel like I need to cut a few more cards before I commit to cutting Darksteel Forge. Like, it's still... A very frustrating card for opponents to have to deal with. Like, they have to have an exile effect right then in order to um, get rid in order to get rid of this one first before they can interact with our other stuff. So that might just be what we need. Like, just to buy that crucial amount of time. Also, it works. It's a great tutor target for Arkham. Be able to turn one of our random artifact creatures in play into that. Every time I get worried that I don't have enough artifact creatures naturally, I remember that our commander just violently places them into play left, right, and center. <laughs> He's just here to make those things, so... Yeah, we can't get rid of Idyllic Tutor... We have, like, three... We have one major enchantment and, like, two decent enchantments after that that all work too well. Like, Training Grounds is huge in this deck to the point where not only do I want to be able to find it, I want to be able to clone it with our commander, which is why the Liquid Metal cards... Like, if we could afford not to run the Liquid Metal cards and just cut the things that aren't artifacts on top of that but then the only way we can get urza's cost down any lower is to um copy the heart the heartstone and that only leaves us with that one card that we can target and if anything happens to it we have to find a way to get it back first so while we are spending two additional deck slots in this deck to work with training grounds, 
I feel like we like training ground is the best one to copy and then anoint anointed procession is the other one. So it's training grounds, anointed procession and mirror made are like the three big enchantments that this deck wants to have. Cause as long as it has like any of them, it's doing pretty decently. Well, sorry, not mirror made annoying procession, liquid met or annoying procession, annoying procession and, um, training grounds make it way easier to go infinite with Urza, like either one of them. So, and being able to copy them, even if we don't have the liquid, maybe I don't need, I was thinking that the mirror maid lets us copy training grounds without one of the liquid metal cards. And that might be like strong enough to justify the mirror maid itself. Also the mirror maid can be any of our other artifacts like anything that's already an artifact, so it can copy all of those, and it can copy anything that we want to turn into an artifact with the liquid metal cards. So, in every way, shape, and form, Mirror Maid is able to copy things that are already worth having, like things that we want to have more than one copy of, which is kind of a thing with this deck, so... If we leave the liquid metal coatings in and we leave the mirror made in, then we have all these other ways to copy, like training grounds and whatnot. And if we can copy that, or even anointed, like anointed procession, if we're getting twice as many tokens and then all of a sudden we're getting four times as many tokens, we don't need Urza to not cost less at that point because Ironworks or Ashnod's Altar will be able to generate infinite mana off of activating Urza anyway. You know, if we get... If we were supposed to get one token, and that's worth two mana, instead we get four tokens, and those tokens are worth eight mana total, we're now plus two mana. So we can sacrifice all of the tokens, still have everything else that we had in play, be up two mana, and activate Urza and get those four tokens back. So... At no point in time are we not infinite then, but we need to get two copies of it. We need to get Anointed Procession to play and clone it so that when we activate him, he doubles to from one to two and then two to four. Also, at some point in time, we need to genuinely just put in the White Dominus from... Uh, New Phyrexia, all will be one, whatever we want to call it, since we already had a New Phyrexia, now we have New New Phyrexia, which is not to be confused with the plane that they take over after they lose in March of the Machines, although there is a part of me that's wondering, like, are they going to lose in March of Machines, or <clears throat> is this going to be one of those things, like, the, the heroes actually lose the March of Machines fight? And then, <clears throat> and every set after that is like, here's what's going on this set. And by the way, now that that's resolved, Phyrexia is here. And that just keeps happening for like two or three sets. And then we have an actual, um, here's how we stop Phyrexia from destroying the magic multiverse. Anyway. Yeah, I'm just speculating on future things. Like, I am very curious, because <clears throat> I feel like if they just beat Phyrexia and undo Phyresis on all of the characters that they've corrupted, that really undercuts a lot of what happened up until this point. Like, we, we lose out on, like... I feel like if Jason, Vraska, and everybody are just fine after this, and they're they're not Phyrexians anymore, and that they, they were like you know, <clears throat> if we rescue everybody from from the Magic Borg, like yes, we can still do stories related to the fallout from that, but we we kind of uh, undo the a lot of the dramatic, um gravitas of the previous story it's like no nah, no nah, you 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 wouldn't really like the whole point into why this is so dramatic is that they actually hit jace specifically out of all of them 
Like, there are a lot of other characters they could have done this to, and it would be a huge deal. But Jace is very frequently one of the, like, if not one, if not the poster character for magic, very close to it. Like, J Jace is the most, uh, I'm a wizard uh, of all of these spellcasters that, that are gathered together, like, he is the frail human in a robe with, with magic powers. Like, what most people that don't even play magic would... Like, if they looked at the entire cast uh, of the Gatewatch assembled, he is the one that's like, okay, so which one of these is a wizard? They point to Jace. Like, like Jace is the most wizard character out of all of the... He, he, is, he is an old man beard away from just being the most generic wizard you could possibly imagine. So, that's like the only thing not high fantasy wizardly about him is that he was like in his 30s or something. Late 20s, early 30s. Um, yeah, and like no, nobody looks at Gideon and goes, yeah, that, that, that's a guy who goes around casting spells and nothing else. Maybe like Liliana. <clears throat> Like if they had, if they were going for a second guess, I think she's like Nisa looks more like a druid, like still kind of wizardly. You could probably pick her. Ch Chandra Chandra looks like some sort of steampunk um, mechanic or something more so than a wizard with with her goggles and, and whatnot. And so yeah, and Gar Garrick again, just like huge, big, beefy. Not that he was part of the Gate Watch, but he was part of the original like five Planeswalkers. Uh, Johnny's a big cat man with with a big bladed weapon. Doesn't look like a spellcaster. Elspeth, you know, looks like a holy knight or something. Not yeah. Jace is the most generic spellcaster looking dude out of the entire like Planeswalker catalog. So the fact that they hit him specifically is one of those like there there was a lot of speculation where like and five of these planeswalkers are going to be Phyrexian and like you know most of the chatter that I saw was like they're never going to do Jace like that they they, w they won't let that their generic wizard guy that they use for like everything be the one that goes down and then he actually gets hit by it so if they undo that i feel like they're undercutting any dramatic tension like unless we actually see jace's body after that he's always alive and he's always going to be fine and <clears throat> so if they undo everything i feel like that's going to undercut a lot of what happened it's going to feel like we we did this for nothing. Let's they they have to they have to end game it basically. They they need to have undoing it be such a dramatic and nearly impossible to recreate situation at that point that it still feels like they did something serious to the characters before undoing it. So one second. Okay, and I'm back. But yeah, I think that if they just, like, we've fixed Foresis, it, it's fine. J Jason, Vraska, and Nahiri, and everybody, they're, they're all fine again. Even if they, like, had to kill one or two of them first and couldn't undo it, <clears throat> I think that would be less dramatic than if they either can't fix it or... <clears throat> Or if they have to do something so over the top in order to fix it. Like, if we don't have Teferi go through... To... <clears throat> That's what I'm wondering is actually going to happen. Teferi's in the past right now. And <clears throat> that creates a lot of potential. 
<clears throat> for Teferi to stop all of this before it happens, <clears throat> which is kind of also like, uh oh, it, it's not, it's all a dream, but it's kind of close to that at that point. I feel like it's like, okay, well, none of it actually happened. Everything is fine. Phyrexia is defeated. <clears throat> this is what, how it would have looked if they had stormed the multiverse and nearly conquered everything. <clears throat> but yeah, uh, I feel like if Teferi can undo it through accidental time travel while while trying to intentionally time travel without destroying the multiverse again, almost. <clears throat> like Urza did by sending Karn back in time <clears throat> to murder baby Yogmoth. Yeah, uh, I think... I think the the story's going to go, like, a little wonky, if depending on how they want to handle this, but... <clears throat> anyway, enough about hypothetical resolutions to the story. I'm more concerned right now for this deck if we just want the white Dominus. I think they're called Dominuses. <clears throat> yeah, I'm more, I'm more concerned about trying to jam him into this deck so that way we can go infinite with more things. <clears throat> but first we gotta make enough cuts that we have a... 60 card deck to begin with and then we can start trying to plot out we already passed original Zendikar do I want to get rid of the map <clears throat> if we get rid of the map then we get rid of the Urzatron and then we get rid of the other thing which frees up a few more deck slots for actual white and blue mana <clears throat> And a lot of the time, those things are going to be a single colorless. I feel like even with two tutors that can go grab them. Yeah, I think that might have been too ambitious to and flavorful to try and brute force the Urzatron into the <clears throat> into the deck when we don't need to. Excuse me. <coughs> wow. I still want to keep Vadim. I can see cutting her eventually for the same reason, and in fact, partially because of cutting <coughs> the uh, Darksteel Forge, because that removes one of our really high casting cost artifacts that we can easily tutor for. We can still tutor for the uh, Spine of Ishsa a lot of the time, and Seven's going to be good enough most of the time to draw us a card. <clears throat> but Nine puts it out of reach of all but like a handful of cards that see any kind of commander play. So... <clears throat> Alright, spell seeker, force of negation, tribute mage. <clears throat> no, we I, for for a half second I was thinking it's like, do we need Lord High Artificer? And the answer is yes, because every time we make a token copy of an artifact, he can tap that artifact for blue mana before we sacrifice it thereby increasing the amount of mana that we get per cycle and reducing how desperately we need to reduce um, the other Ur the other Urza, the Prince of Krug's activation cost down. <laughs> yeah, we reduce how much reduction we need in order for him to work better. If every artifact taps for an additional blue mana before it dies. And because of the way Urza Lord High Artificer is worded, he's not... Artifacts have tap, add blue. He's tap and untapped artifact, add blue. So you can use it on your freshly created uh, artifact creatures without them having haste or anything. So. And a 
Cosmic Extinction, Grand Crescendo. Yeah, we can get rid of the Workshop while I'm here. We can just delete it. Get rid of the other Urzatron. Go back up towards the top. Cut these two out. So yeah, we just delete those. Hey, 88. So, 28 more cuts, and we're good. <clears throat> and I have less than an hour before I have to get ready for work. Ah, oh, there's my live time. Yeah, with the new Stream Elements thing, it has to tell me that's powered by Stream Elements, so it kind of pushed everything over a bit from where I'm used to looking for it. So now the CPU usage is, like, where my um, uptime would normally be, so I had to go find the uptime. All right, you can clear these two off. Yeah, 88 cards, so 28 more cuts, and Urza is good to go. Do we cut Coat of Arms? Coat of Arms felt like a good backup to what we were doing because you don't need that many copies of Coat of Arms as a soldier creature before all of them are functionally lethal. Like, what was it? We need, like, five to kill a player, basically. Like, because we have five instances of all of our creatures get plus four, plus four. So, the all five of them are like 20-something power at that point. So, two of them connecting are lethal. On a player from full, from starting life total. So, yeah, it's not that hard to win the game at that point. Just by copying the coat of arms itself. But maybe we don't need it. Like, we have enough other ways to win the game. I did like that it's just Urza and Coat of Arms, and we can slow activate Urza over a few turns, and that would be more than enough to kill everybody. Or at least force uh, players to respond to it. Although I would rather just win the game than get in the, into a position where, okay, they have to actually interact with our stuff now, and then... You know, we rebuild after that, and all they've done is kill one card and force um, Urza to cost two more to come back into play, but <clears throat> maybe that in and of itself isn't good enough. Yeah, maybe we don't need Time Spiral... Keeping Metal Worker for that explosive start. And Gilded Lotus. <clears throat> Sad Robot. Do we cut Sad Robot from this deck? He's a four mana ramp spell. And he draws us a card. He's a decent target though that's probably the biggest thing is he's a decent target for urza because then we get to um get more land out of our deck and then draw more cards when all of our artifacts die so bright earth we need thorn of amethyst we need <sighs> the revel arc works really well if some of our pieces die, because it can get back almost everything. The same things that we can get, that we can tutor for with the um, Recruiter of the Guard, we can revive with Revel Arc. So, I feel like we might wind up cutting it anyway, but for right now, we leave it in. And it's another one of those things that's really good to target with... Um, liquid metal coating, and then make a copy of it, and then sack the copy. 
suppose we don't need Sanctum Gargoyle. If we, like, I was thinking about cutting uh, Junk Diver or uh, Mirror Retriever before, but we should probably cut Sanctum Gargoyle first. Because it's way more expensive. It gets us the card up front, which is nice. Like, we can just clone it and buy back the card. But unless we are buying back specifically Ashnod's Altar or Crack Clan Ironworks, I think we would rather have the ones where we can sacrifice them and get back the card in order to set this up. Your battles for your spine. Metamorph. <clears throat> Again, biggest thing about Metamorph is that it's always an artifact, so whatever we copy, like if we turn something into an artifact until end of turn and we copy it, Metamorph itself is forever an artifact, so I don't need, I don't need to liquid metal coating it, and whatever I copy, you know, when I make the copy with Urza, will also be an artifact and get the buff from Urza and be sacrificable to Ironworks. So... Because that is one of the weirdest things about this deck, is turning something into an artifact and making the soldier token copy with Urza doesn't automatically mean it's an artifact because of the way the rules of magic work with copying things, so... That that is the weirdest situation we can get into. Alright, Codex Shredder might just I think the biggest problem with Codex Shredder is actually how much mana it is to get something back. Not that it is a colorless regrowth effect that we can run in our deck that can get back any of our cards, including like counter spells to protect our setup and you know any non-artifact card that we might have lost. Maybe we do need to cut one counter spell. One, two, three, four cards we're cutting now. Seeker, Force of Negation. There's a... Maybe the idol is too slow. Like, if we're not already winning, we're only getting the extra card every time we pay six for Urza. I am cutting Time Spiral too, so I'm... Cutting a lot of our card draw is the biggest issue. But our primary way of making tokens is Urza, which is six mana, so yes, we can do it multiple times in a turn. But if we can do it cheaply enough that we're activating it like every player's turn, then we don't really need. Yeah. Like, if we're making copies of idols and then drawing cards on each player's turn, then we've technically already won, and we're just looking for the thing that actually finishes the game at that point. And I think if we just keep in more things that finish the game at that point, we can cut idol, but I am kind of concerned about how much card draw we've cut at this point. I don't do a very good job of drawing cards anymore. I do do a very good job of tutoring for things, though. And specifically things that can generate card advantage, but I'm starting to feel like I almost want um, like an Icar Wellspring back in or something, but... Five... 
But we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Like, at the end, if I still feel like we don't have enough card draw. Like, either that or maybe because we have so many shuffle and tutor effects, maybe I want um, Scroll Rack back in. Also, Scroll Rack and Icker Wellspring are both tutorable by our one our tribute mage that we have left, so that also helps. We're down to 83, so we need 23 more cups. Oops, I did that thing again. That clipboard. <sighs> Just gonna stretch here a little bit. <sighs> Starting to slouch in the chair while doing this. <sighs> so I want to sit up, back into position. Actually, look at these cards. Yeah, maybe, maybe we cut Palancron. Like, we need to have seven land, specifically. And the only way we get more land, ooh, excuse me, is from Sad Robot. Like, that is our only consistent way to put more land into play. To make sure that we actually have the seven to activate him. So, yes, he wins the game when we get to seven, but <sighs> we have Spine and we have Meteor Golem. Maybe we don't also need Duplicate. Like, all three of them are kind of doing the same thing. Duplicate is a little bit cheaper, but it also only hits creatures. Does Exile, which is nice, but. We do have Lion Sash. The, like, the biggest downside is something that either does not go to the graveyard due to a replacement effect, or that can jump out of the graveyard easily enough that we need to have Lion Sash and we need to have the activation, and maybe we need to be able to activate it, like, two or three times in a turn to make sure we get rid of the thing. <clears throat> you know, something that's that obnoxious and comes back that easy. But yeah, I think with the Spine and the Meteor Golem, we have enough creatures that stop our opponent's stuff when they come into play that we don't need a third one that's limited in what card types it can interact with for only one less mana. Yeah, the Exiling is probably the more relevant part of its text than anything else on it, but... We gotta make cuts, <clears throat> and I think that might be one of them then. <clears throat> and I am also debating the Revel Arc. Also, we cut the um, Overcharged Amalgam. I don't know if we also want to cut the Glenelendra Archmage. The token copies can only counter one spell, so that's not helping as much. <clears throat> Maybe I do want to get rid of Glenelendra. Definitely useful and very powerful, and is in a lot of my blue decks in Commander for its ability to counter up to two spells, but. <clears throat> Do I want to get rid of Revel Arc? Dies to get back to low power creatures, which can be pretty potent things when I have a lot of uh, base zero zeros in the deck that get bonuses. <clears throat> Is that going to allow me to get back much 
larger creatures, technically. In addition to all of the things, like, everything I can get with Imperial Recruiter, or Imperial Recruiter, uh, Recruiter of the Guard, I can get with Revel Arc back from the graveyard. So, just about. In fact, Revel Arc gets a few more things that the Recruiter can't get, because I have a bunch of, like, 1-4s and 2-3s and such, where their toughness isn't low enough, but their power still is. But I don't have very many creatures. In fact, I don't think I have anything that has two toughness and three power in the deck. Or more. I don't think there's any three twos or four twos in the deck. Unless I'm forgetting something. So yeah, Revel Arc can get back basically every creature... It gets back every creature that the Recruiter of the Guard can get, and a lot of the things I wish the Recruiter of the Guard could get. Like, all of the things that uh, Imperial Recruiter could have gotten if it could go into this deck. Team... So, well... Did I already cut, um, what's its name? Where was the return to return to Ravnica? It was, yeah, there it is. I was going to say, did I already cut summary dismissal? But I don't think that I did. And I'm starting to think that I do like its versatility. I like what it can deal with. Like, it deals with things that other cards can't deal with. Like, if somebody uses Boseju and then casts a Wrath that would destroy all of our artifacts, uh, Summary Dismissal can still stop that. Um, it can also counter uh, activated and triggered abilities. Which disallow can too. It's just that Summary Dismissal is that one extra mana. Having to hold up four mana can be difficult sometimes. Holding up three mana can be a little difficult sometimes. So the less mana that I need to have available. Also, sometimes I'm holding up all of the mana for all of the counters, and this one being four is still a bit much. Although it does have the added bonus of being able to counter all of the other spells and abilities currently on the stack, so. It is the most expensive out of our counter spells, though, and I feel like we need to cut a counter spell. Like, we already cut the Glenelendra, so if we cut this one also. Because that leaves us with counter spell, mana drain. Disallow, Force of Will, Force of Negation, Pact of Negation, and Dovin's uh, Veto. Oh, and um, Fierce Guardianship. Yeah, we still have eight counter spells in the deck. Maybe I need to cut one more. <clears throat> Which inclines me to cut either the Disallow or maybe... Like, the Pact or the Force of Negation. Like, one of those cards. Oh, right, we have an offer you can't refuse, too. So, yeah, we definitely need to cut another counter spell To make room. Hmm. <sighs> Maybe it's disallow then. I do like the idea of disallow though for um, things that I didn't have a counter spell in hand at the time, but now they're doing the thing and I need to get rid of like countering Oblivion Ring or not Oblivion Ring, uh, Oblivion Stone or a Planeswalker Ultimate or anything else where I couldn't counter the actual source of the effect. Like, you get a lot of um, surprise value out of being able to counter an activated or triggered ability. Um, cards that have effects when they're cycled, for example. Uh, if somebody cycles 
decree of annihilation w with the idea that they're going to blow up everybody's lands or decree of pain with the idea that they're going to kill a whole lot of little creatures and draw a card and then they don't get to do that i mean they still get to draw the card because they're two separate um trigger like paying the activating the ability to cycle a card is the activated ability when it's cycled is a separate triggered ability so but we still might want to cut that one over any of the free ones cuz when we're comboing off we want to be able to use all of our mana if we need to so any of the counter spells that can be cast for free the problem is is that we can't cast um force of negation for free if we're going off on our own turn which we probably are i don't think i need to get through turn cycles before i suddenly make a thousand thorn of amethyst thorn of amethyst uh token creatures so Hmm. What do I want to? Because yeah, we can leave and disallow, and we can cut force of negation. Force of negation is still good though on turns where our opponents. <sighs> but disallow lets us counter the activated abilities that can still be present if we've put enough of the, um. Things, although we won't be able to cast disallow ourselves since I don't have any way to reduce the casting cost of our spells anymore. So if I put like a thousand, um, whatchamacallits into play, if I put a thousand sphere of resistances into play, then we can't cast disallow or force of negation or anything else anyway if somebody finds a way around the increased casting costs. So, yeah, maybe we still don't need this allow then. I was thinking that it would protect us from the things that can actually affect the board, but the downside to that is we won't be able to cast them to be able to do that. So, kind of a wash. All right, so one, two, three, four, five. What does that bring us down to 83? Oh, no, we were at 83, so... 78. Hey, okay. getting there. I did it again. And we're back. Uh, one day, professional streamer, maybe. Doesn't mean I won't still make all of those terrible, terrible mistakes, but over and over again and refuse to manage to learn from them. But anyway, less than 20 cards now. So, what 20-ish cards can we live without? Do we have any other counter spells I'm forgetting about? So we have counter spell, mana drain, force of will, Robot, Tower, Works, Tower of Reckoning, Turn to Dust, Pact of Negation, so we're up to four now. Monogrift. Team, Scrap Trawler, Walking Ballista, War of Invention, Anointed Procession. Veto is five. Offer is six.
Their force is seven. Fierce guardianship is eight. I believe that's all these straight up counter spells. Maybe we could cut one more. I feel like if we cut one more, it's force of negation. Since again, we're not, it's not helping us <clears throat> counter a spell on the turn that we go off, right? It has to be during the opponent's turn that we can exile the card. 99.9% .9 sure that's how force of negation works, but let's just get that last fraction of a percent. Yeah, if it's not your turn, you may exile a blue card rather than... So, yeah. Good for stopping opponents from comboing off. Worse for letting us combo off. So, I think we'll keep Force of Will and Pact of Negation. And then all of the cheaper counter spells. Uh, Fierce Guardianship also free when Urza's in play, and we need Urza to do most of our comboing anyway, so. <clears throat> we still could cut the Night Paladin from... <clears throat> What's its name? Uh, from the Warhammer decks. <clears throat> yeah, it doesn't look like I'm quite gonna finish. I desperately need some more water. I got a little bit of time. I'll mute the mic. I'll grab some water. I'll be back. <clears throat> All right, I grabbed more water and I'm back. Don't have a ton of time left, but maybe, just maybe we can get, <clears throat> I don't think we're gonna get all of the cards. So we did need to actually get rid of Force of Negation also. <sighs> down here get rid of that <clears throat> which leaves us with all of these yeah I don't see room to get rid of more targeted removal Crypt arcane signet skyclave relic liquid metal torque 
Do we get rid of dark steel ingot since I got rid of the um <clears throat> the intruder alarm now? Like Skyclave Relic is still fine. I do like the idea of having indestructible mana dorks though, like that allows me to build up my resources in a way that's harder for the opponents to just get rid of and they tend to clog the ground up a lot too yeah I think we leave that in for right now it's a little bit tempting Power Stone Shard also because of the exponential growth. Like, the Power Stone Shard taps for one. If I make a token copy of it, then this taps for two, and one side out of Summoning Sickness range, the other one taps for two. Also, I think I mentioned this before, if we move Lightning Greaves around, or even um, Swift Foot Boots under the right circumstances, we start actually netting mana from these things and start um, actually producing more mana than we're spending. It does take a lot of mana or us to have already reduced the activation cost on Urza, but eventually we get to the point where we are generating infinite mana that way. So... <clears throat> Muzio's decent, but maybe... <sighs> He's three to cast and four to use. How often are we going to bother casting him and activating him over casting Urza and then activating Urza? Since we always have the option to activate Urza, how often are we going to want to do this? I feel like the answer is not often enough. Get rid of him, though. Like, that's another potential card advantage thing, like, where we just get to look for artifacts in the top of our deck and, and find, you know, like, things to put into play that can generate more cards, theoretically. Or just give us what we needed in the first place. Like, just, oh, here, here's the... Here's the Ironworks or the Altar or depending on what we had... Um, you know, like find a battle sphere or something to kickstart all of this. Hmm. I mean, we're at that point where everything I cut kind of hurts, so we just have to cut the things that are not doing enough. X or less from my graveyard to play, then if X is 6 plus, they become 4-4s. Four the problem is, is that, or not the problem, the benefit is, is that we don't need for X to be 6 or more. Um, a lot of the times, X can be 4, and that will get us back almost everything that could, not even reasonably, almost everything that could be in our graveyard, I feel like. The fact that we might be able to get back other more expensive stuff once we hit six, and I guess seven is the most, um, like, 
I don't see us actually yet having Darksteel Forge in the graveyard. Like, I feel like that's either in our deck or in play or in exile. Like, it's never going to... Like, okay, we can get it counterspelled if I hard cast it, but... I'm not even 100% sure I still want that. <clears throat> Maybe Dance of the Mance gets to go. I definitely want to keep the artifact tutors. Like, even a triple blue, I think War of Invention is too... <clears throat> too versatile to get rid of. Team still going to stay in for now. Racers, Cyclonic Rift, Metamorph, Spine. Yeah, we can't really get rid of Tezzeret either, can we? Like, there's way too much potential in turning Tezzeret into an artifact and making a token copy of him. You know, like, we minus three Tezzeret and we get... Because two is, seems to be one of the um, key converted mana costs for um, getting things from our deck. One of the other ones, though, is four, which Urza, or Urza, which Tezzeret can do right away. I think he starts on... Maybe he starts on five. Let me double-check that. I think he starts on four, though. The Seeker. Yeah. Yeah, he starts on four, so... While he can go get us our four drops, which we have several of them that I might want to tutor for, I feel like. What are our four drops that we want to tutor for? Like, he can get our twos and threes, so he's staying in regardless. Uh, what do we cash him in for, though? Because if we don't ever have to cash him in, then we make a token copy of him and minus three the token copy and go get our heart zone or whatever or... Oh, I think uh, Car Clan Ironworks is four. Ashnod's Altar is three, but Ironworks is four. Uh, Mindless Automaton, which is a decent card advantage engine on top of that for our deck. Yeah, I can get Sad Robot. I don't know. Oh, we can get the Voltaic Construct and the Ironworks. Yeah. Yeah, there's too many decent four drops that might just win us the game by tutoring them we can get lodestone golem to kick that off if that's going to be our thing like if we've already lost um the sphere of resistance then depending on what I'm afraid of will determine whether or not I need Thorn of Amethyst or um, the Lodestone Golem as my primary target. Get Scrap Trawler, which is super helpful. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so Tezzeret was always going to stay in, I think, but... I'm, I was more curious, like, what we're going to be able to get with him that has, like, a higher, that's, like, the four where we would kill him to go get it. Like, what is actually worth killing Tezzeret to go grab out of our deck? And I think that's everything. I really don't want to get rid of the Revel Arc, but I think it's it's just barely good enough. Like, it does enough stuff when we have it that I kind of want to keep it. Like, I already cut a couple other ways to get our stuff back. 
So the Revel Arc is about it for some things. Also, it can get back something like Tameshi, who can then get back a non-creature artifact or enchantment if we desperately need him to, which we might desperately need him to. Yeah, with the Codex Shredder gone, we might need something that can get back basically anything. So if we can combine those two, we can definitely... Well, Tameshi himself can basically get back everything that we couldn't already get back. Um, like, he can get back enchantments, he can get back artifacts, and therefore can get back uh, artifact creatures also. So that only leaves our non-creature artifacts that we can't rebuy as permanents. Oh, and Planeswalkers. Yeah. Our non-artifact creatures and our Planeswalkers, which, you know, <clears throat> we could get back the non-artifact creatures with Revel Arc at that point. But we can also use it to get back, you know, if we turn the Revel Arc into an artifact and make a copy of it, um, and then sacrifice the copy, then we get back two other creatures and, you know, all three of those creatures together, assuming that none of them are making other creatures, is six mana that we can get from, um, the whatchamacallit, from, or six mana we can get to activate Urza again and keep going, so... So yeah, I want to be able to keep activating Urza and keep going, so... Revel Arc kind of doing that. It's a little more, like... A, we need Ashnod's Altar because the copies won't be artifacts, so it's not like we can keep turning them into artifacts. Because I'm not bothering with the Thran Forge anymore, and that would also add two mana to the cost, so... Now we desperately need one of them to be making tokens, and we only have one straight up. This card comes into play, make tokens in the form of the Mere Battle Sphere. All right. Yeah, we're going to keep letting the Revel Arc sit there for a while. Until it's like one of the last cards to cut. Do I really need Darksteel Forge? Do I really need Arkham for that matter? Arkham is still a tutor. Like, sacrifice our artifact creatures, go get our non-creature artifacts to play. So, he's still decently good. Like, we might have to make the token creature for him to sacrifice in order to go get one of our other non-creature artifacts from our deck, but that might be enough for him. Alright, it's just about one thirty. So, I'm going to have to call it here, because i got to get ready for work. So, yeah, it looks like we'll be finishing Urza tomorrow, hopefully, with only 15 cuts left to go. I'm not 100% sure if, um, if we get, like, if the general public gets access to... Uh, Phyrexia all is one tomorrow, or if there's, like, an early streamer thing for that, but if it is available tomorrow, I'll, like, do Urza in the morning while everybody else is crashing Magic Arena, and then, like, later in the evening, I'll just start drafting, uh, Phyrexia until I can't draft Phyrexia anymore. Um, assuming that's an option. Otherwise, I'll be back on, we'll do... We'll finish off Urza, and then I'll look into doing something else later that day. But yeah, that's going to do it for me for now. So thanks for watching. I hope you've enjoyed building Urza with me. And we're almost there. 15 more cuts, and we'll be good to go. Um, that might take like a two-hour stream with Urza. <clears throat> 
tomorrow just to finish him off because these last couple cuts have been brutal, but we will cross that bridge when we come to it. So thanks for watching and have a good rest of your day.